Okay, a lot of pretty pictures, lots of numbers here. So the maximum value, if you basically just look at the green bar, the red bar is last year and the blue bar is from 2010, the maximum value of our 56 organizations had an annualized cost of cybercrime of just about $46 million, which is a huge chunk of change. That's, not, that's pretty serious. Now, we know that there's mean and median are very important to look at. We know the distribution is skewed to the large, which is normal, but we don't believe those are outliers. We believe those are numbers that would happen if we doubled our sample, we'd double that, that number. But the grand mean is about 8 point, uh, let's see, 8.9 million, up from 8.3 million, which was up from 6.5 million when we first started to do the study in 2010. Median and then minimum value. So when you look at this, you see there's actually quite a bit of cost. Even when you're dealing with the minimum value of a million and a half dollars, a lot of organizations don't spend that directly or even indirectly on security. So it is a huge number. Next slide. In terms of quartile analysis, we do quartile analysis because we know sometimes the numbers get really screwy when you have really, really large observations. But it actually shows that you know, the distribution that our number, that $8 million, that $8.9 million is actually a pretty good place. That's somewhere between quartile two and three. So it just tells us that the distribution is skewed to kind of the larger, more expensive observations. But again, we don't believe those are outliers. So we're not removing them from our sample. Next slide. Okay, another EKG. In terms of organizational size, uh, the, or excuse me, the total cost, you'll notice that there's quite a bit of variance. The magenta line, the dotted line, is in fact the mean. And you'll see that there are in fact two or three that are very, very tall, but we don't believe those are anomalies. We believe that again, if we doubled our sample size, we'd have two of these. If we tripled our sample size, we'd, we believe that is in fact the case. Not all companies experience the same magnitude of cybercrime each and every year. It's not predictable. That's because the bad guy is stealthy, the bad guy is invisible, and the bad guy's attack vector is constantly changing and morphing. So you can't say, oh, well, this is a, an outlier, take it out of your uh, data, because if we doubled or tripled or quadrupled their sample, we might actually see this happen over and over again in some cases. Next slide. OK, look at this diagram. So if you take that 8.9 million, what this tells us that we could actually start to build a precision interval. How many people are statisticians here? OK, no one's admitting it. No one's raising their hand. Thank you. Well, uh, there, there's a methodology. It's, it, when you have small samples, like 56 observations, you can't use parametric statistics. You can, but it would, it's not right. So we use non-parametric statistical analysis. And it just tells us that roughly the cost, that if I want to be 99% accurate based on the sample, it's a number between 11.6 to $6 million as an average for the sample. That's all it's telling us. So it, we know the numbers are big no matter what. Next slide. OK, so now what does this tell us? Percentage external cost. There's no question that the cost around that information loss, the, inf the loss of intellectual property, is going to be more expensive than business disruption, revenue loss, equipment damage. And you're probably saying, Larry, what's this other cost category? That's everything else. In activity-based costing, you have to have a residual. And sometimes it's just a messy thing, and you just can't get beyond that 2%. You try. And, but you don't actually tease out these other costs. So these are probably related to these, but we don't know that, so we're just calling it other costs. Keep in mind that information loss and business disruption are by far the two most costly external consequences. Next slide. OK. In terms of internal activity, detection and recovery are normally the two most expensive. And we see that this year as well. Ex post response, which is all of the stuff you do after you've detected and, and are dealing with the cybercrime prior to containment, a lot of activity goes into that category. Then containment, investigation and incident management are actually separated in the model, but we were thinking about combining these two because there's a lot of overlap. So there, there are definitional differences in our activity-based costing model, and we could actually consolidate, we think we could consolidate the, those two categories. OK, I told you I'm an accountant. This gets me all excited. This is kind of a boring life. <laughs> you know, some people like sports cars. Some people like flying. I, like, I also have an airplane, which I like to fly. That, that's the cool part. Any pilots in here? Oh, what do you fly? Oh, oh you're a Navy pilot. Oh, you're a real pilot. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just a fake, you know, civilian pilot. OK. 
So percentage internal cost for six activity centers. This one is kind of a, an interesting way of looking at the data. And we did this, I have to admit, you know, HP is our sponsor. We're completely independent uh, in the research. But they asked us to look at this, so we looked at it. So this is an HP question. The question, and we'll see this throughout, that by deploying certain tools like security intelligence tools, does it make a difference from a cost perspective? And if you look at the, yes, we have security intelligence, it does make a difference in some cases. You'll notice that the no is taller in some cases, especially around investigation and incident management, if you have this tool than if you don't have the tool. And the moral of that story is, you can actually change your cost curve by having different technologies or by not having certain technologies in place. Next slide, please. Okay, annualized cost by attack type. Now we're getting into the weeds. So if we basically look at the, if we, theoretically, if every single organization that participated in our study had all of these, what would be the annualized cost of each of these attack vectors? So I know I said a lot there, but this assumes that every one of these, every one of the companies experienced, what would it look like? And you would see, you clearly see that a malicious code is going to be much more expensive than, say, malware, botnets, and viruses at the bottom of the list. Denial of service is number two. Web-based attacks, stolen devices, like laptops and so on, malicious insiders. So if you do this by an annualized cost that every organization experiences, we get these kinds of interesting numbers. By the way, you'll notice in the denial of service category, there's a missing bar. It's not an error. It's just that we didn't have that in our first study, that particular type of attack. Next slide. Now, if we look at internal costs and we divide by the frequency of the, the actual attacks, it actually shifts the cost data in an interesting way. Here, now, denial of service pops up. But remember, Malicious Insider was kind of fourth or fifth on the list before. Now that pops up. And basically, what this tells us is that denial of service and Malicious Insider, when we actually analyze by frequency and web-based attacks and malicious code, those four are the, basically the most costly to an organization. So it doesn't mean the moral of that story is not that don't worry about malware, viruses, and botnets, because they can do things. Like a botnet could be the source to a denial of service attack or a distributed denial of service attack, as you know. So you can't just rule out one and say it's not, a, it's not costly. Plus, you get a lot more of these, right? You get a lot more malware than you, have denial, than you would have denial of service or web-based attack or malicious code. And malicious code is interesting because malware becomes malicious code if it infiltrates the network or the enterprise system. OK, next slide. In terms of the annualized cost by category, cash outlay, direct labor, overhead, indirect labor, productivity losses, which are in fact indirect costs. They're not actually an opportunity loss. They are real costs because people are not able to do their job. So an example is someone's laptop is stolen, and for a period of time, that person is not doing the job while they're waiting for their back new laptop to be rebuilt or backup data put on it. Those are productivity losses that we measure. But cash outlay is actually our biggest category in cost. Next slide. Doing a great job on the slides. You're awesome. OK. I think we could, did we do the next slide? There it is, OK. Now, caveat, very big caveat. Remember we talked about small sample size. So it's hard to generalize these numbers. But we actually show it because we think over time some of these will actually form an interesting pattern. In this year, utility, defense, financial service are at the top. And at the bottom, we have retail, public sector, consumer products, and hospitality. Um, the education and research organization, I would warn you, this is the first time that we had this organization. And this is an organization that does a lot of government research. And so when you think about like a defense contractor losing information, you have a heart attack, think that of that kind of a research organization. So you know, maybe affiliated with MIT, located in Bedford, Massachusetts. Kind of a, I don't want to tell you who it is, but keep in mind that they, the research, more, more so than on the education side. OK. Yeah, we, so, OK, so we did a study. I can't tell. This is a private study that we did for a company. Um, can I mention it, Susan? OK, Accenture. <laughs> And uh, we basically looked at the innovation. We actually talked to people outside of security to try to figure out what was their mindset around security. 
And we only looked at people in kind of the research and development mode. So it wasn't like marketers and those kinds of folks. And we found that there was a correlation in their perception between innovation and command and control security. That security was viewed as a block to innovation. Not in every industry, though, but certainly in some industries. Like financial services and healthcare made virtually zero difference. But they're not research-oriented. Technology, um, research-oriented organizations seem to see it as a, not, not as, a, as a, something that enhances your capability, but detracts from your capability to innovate as a company. It's the golden goose book. It, it is the golden goose book. Great, great question. I suppose I'm done. Yeah, thank you well, very thank much. Well, thank you, everybody. That was great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.